even better in HD on Sky Channel 258. Are you having fun at the moment? Are you kidding? No, I'm not having fun at all. <laughs> I remember him as being a very humorous bloke around the scene. He was very kind of gregarious. Well, I always thought Sid was a good-looking, well haircutted called Bert. If someone had to be the cartoon rock, punk rock, it might as well be Sid. He was pretty good at it. He burned your eyes. He was so beautiful. Anyone who thinks he was just this moron who was just sort of like screaming around, beating people up, it's just nonsense. It was just an image. What was the next question? This is one great fat pimple on the arse of punk. I don't think he could have fitted in. He just felt the rules and life were foolish and petty. Sid was one of those guys you could see it right from the beginning. He was destined for disaster. I think. Robert, who killed his girlfriend, couldn't do anything and was completely stupid. I mean, you can't get any more punk than that. Where would you like to be? Under the ground. We were quite naughty boys, I think. Certainly, myself, John Lydon, John Beverly, or you know, John Ritchie, as you said, was also known as. But John Gray was a, was a kind of a super nerd, um, but to the point of being mad. So he was a very funny, like quite likable bloke. And we met at Kingsway College of Further Education. John had had meningitis. I met him first of all, and then he already knew Sid because he'd been at Hackney College, and Sid followed him over to Kingsway. Kingsway was. A it was a great place. I didn't realise what a great place it, it was to go to, in, only in retrospect, because you had a real mixture of people there, working class, boys and girls from uh, East and North London, mainly. Isn't it kind of bohemian vibe going on? And I met, I met hippies for the first time. Of course, we would make fun of all these hippies and bohemians, and it was John Lydon that introduced me to the roundhouse gigs on a Sunday night where it was a jolly good wheeze to go and poke fun at hippies, in a, in a kind of, not in a completely horrible way. And that's where I met them. And the first time I met Sid, it was a Halloween party. And there was these two new guys that I'd never seen before. Um, and this guy, he was absolutely, he was gorgeous. He was, he looked different to everybody else because it was about 1974 when everyone still had long hair and, you know, that sort of tail end of a hippie thing, glam rock thing. And this guy had like slick back hair and a leather jacket, the chain with the um, lock thing on it, and the studded wristband. I was just totally mesmerised. I was like, fascinated. I thought, well, you know, who is this guy? I had three jobs at the same time. I was being a night shift manager at a hotel. Um, the Portobello Hotel, and I used to get the pistols along there to sort of like just annoy the guests. Um, I was on the dole, and I was also working <laughs> in sex, just because, you know, getting loads of money where well, you needed it for those clothes. I mean, Vivian charged a fortune. It was in World's End, you know, down the end of the King's Road. It looked odd, I think, for the time. You literally walked through this glass door with this sort of huge metal grating on the front into what was like this open space with just one rail going down the middle and we were in the back by the little counter. There were about three of us all together, me, Debbie and Tracy, and we really didn't do anything, to be honest with you. We just sat around posing. I mean, that's what it was all about. I mean, everyone would come in. We were like mannequins to show off the clothes. I mean, I was a fan of Vivian's clothes long before I actually got involved in the whole music side of it, and I'd go in and wear everything, and that's why she asked me to sort of go and work there. I sell more T-shirts than anything else in the shop, particularly this one. This has been my best-selling T-shirt this year. Thank goodness for, for a bit of sanity somewhere. I used to work at Malcolm's shop, like at Rock. There was a crowd of people who used to spend their Saturday afternoons wandering up and down the King's Road between Boy, or Acme Attractions it was called then, and, and Let It Rock, and he was one of those people. I became a customer of the sex shop, or 
too fast to live to young to die as it was then. I basically just wanted a pair of brothel creepers, so I had to uh, walk the whole, you know, I walked the whole length of the King's Road, uh, going where, you know, where the fuck is it? And and uh, in my school uniform, and found the shop, and that was, you know, and I was sort of I, that, that I was there most days ever since since that really. <laughs> <laughs> there were always these young kids coming in, they'd all come and hang around. And Sid was really just one of those. I mean, heard about the, the vibe of the shop and how sort of like trendy it was becoming. And he just gravitated towards it like a lot of people did. All the ones who, who went on to, to fame and fortune, Susie, they all sort of just came in off the off chance and then just hung around and stayed and became friends. The very first time was in Tottenham Court Road, and I now realise it was him. And he was walking up the road really fast, and he had uh, really big platform espadrilles on Oxford bags, and then like, I tied up a kind of Hawaiian shirt and like loads and loads of bangles. And this was in seventy, like Bowie days, and, and a David Bowie haircut. The four Johns went to a bloke called Keith at Smile Hairdressers in Knightsbridge. So at that time, oh, the crop thing's coming back, but the, but the twist on it was you had it dyed and you could have it blue. It was like, oh, okay, right, you know. So you dye, yeah, and that was an adventure, dyeing your hair shocking white or jet black, you know, and all that. I remember the first time I saw Sid was outside a pub in Labrook Grove and there was, it was him and John Lydon standing together out on the pavement and Sid was tall and thin with black spiky hair and John was tall and thin with blonde spiky hair and they looked like a matching pair kind of thing and they were in nice clothes, sort of, you know, a bit safety pinned and um, kind of interesting looking pretty. They both look very pretty boys actually. My first real memory of Sid is uh, the pistol played um a place called Bang's Disco, which became the Astoria on the corner of Charing Cross Road. But at that point, it was like a gay disco. And they did two sets, and um, they played the first set, and there was absolutely no response for, from anybody. I mean, there was barely anybody there anyway. And Sid came bounding up after the first set and said to me and Susie, um, they've been told that we've all got to dance, or they won't go back on again. But that's really where you get the, the origin of the pogo. It's not because he was trying to bash into people because there were loads of people there and he couldn't see. He was six foot something. He could see everybody, everything, you know. He decided that his way of showing his appreciation was just to, you know, go vertical up in the air, basically. It was just like this unique kind of dance. I had noticed him as one of the new generation, one of the new crowd. But when he really came full face on, it was when he um, kind of loped up to me and, he, and, and said with a broad grin on his face, I want to be the lead singer of an all-girl band. And, and I just thought this was wonderful. So I said, um, OK, well, I'll introduce you to a couple of young women who We'd be very happy to be in a band with you. Someone said, oh, Viv wants to be in a band, and Sid said, oh, well, I'll be in a band with you. And I thought, God, great. You know, he, he wasn't in a band, but I, I was, you know, he looked good. That's all that mattered then. It didn't matter. No one ever asked anyone else if you could play. It was just a matter of how good you looked. <laughs> so we decided to meet up in about a week's time and jam together, all except we couldn't play, but um, at Joe Strummer's Squat. I hadn't met Sid at that time, but what happened is, uh, I'd worked with Rat and I'd worked with um, a few other people like Chrissy Hind on this band that was supposedly going to happen, but it didn't. And uh, Rat had worked with Brian, knew Brian, and wanted me to meet him uh, at the Marquee, I think it was. And the idea was he'd see how I looked, we'd talk and see if we liked the same music, and uh, the gist of it is I would be auditioned for the band. I knew they were going to see another singer. I decided I would come down, I don't know, 40 minutes early or something and see who the competition was, basically. So I came down early, nobody ever showed, and it turned out it was Sid Vicious, and he'd never shown up. I think there was always a bit of animosity between us because uh, I think he'd always wanted to be the singer in the band, and so he disliked me, you know. He didn't actually know me, but he just didn't like me. Very early on, knowing him, I went up to his flat 
which was Queensbridge Road with, uh, with John, Johnny Lydon. And we went up there and I met his mum. And here I am suddenly in this, this you know, there's not a dad there. And, uh, and she's on drugs. And, uh, and there weren't any sort of furnishings as such, you know. So this was like, hmm. Yeah, I've been in a few squats and druggy, but this was, hmm, it's not very nice. You know, it's not very homely. And she's banging up, starts banging up, I think, the smack. And he starts banging up the, uh, the speed. I was, I was, I'm 16. I'm 16 years of age looking at this. My mate banging up with his mum. Mm, you know. And I was like, mm, what a, it was a very stark, uh, stark image. The basic idea behind the Sex Pistols, to tell you the truth, naive that I must have been at the time, was to actually compete with the Bay City Rollers. <laughs> right. My personal favourite Bay City punk rock is that it's nauseating, disgusting, degrading, ghastly, sleazy, prurient, wireistic, and generally nauseating. I think that just about covers it, as far as I'm concerned. Um, I think most of these groups would be vastly improved by sudden death. The first time the thought of a band or music coming into play was when John turned up and said, yeah, I'm in a band. And I was like, what? He might as well have said, I'm opening up a psychiatrist practice or I am going to Boeing where I'm going to learn to be a jet pilot. What? You're in a band? Because at that time, the prevailing culture wasn't for people to learn instruments, you know. We've done a few oddball places. We played at St Martin's Art College. I got that show. We did play at Central School of Art. We did Ravensbourne School of Art. One at Chelsea. So we was kind of on this frippery with the scene. Hey, I don't think we really knew how to get sort of proper gigs. Although maybe we weren't quite ready at that stage. Because we used to turn up with our equipment and just like crash in and do the gigs. Nobody knew we was playing until we got there. We didn't even know actually. I can only remember that those kids were um, believing that they were at the beginning of something um, and they believed they had in their reach something authentic and they were not going to ever let that go. It was a rare jewel, like a ruby in a field of tin. The first time I actually saw him was in a rehearsal room. That was when they first made an impression on me. John took me down there. I don't think John realised what a big deal for me, because I'm like, wow, you know, it's a rehearsal room, you know, uh, people playing, yeah, it was amazing. And um, I remember Glenn Matlock, really, because I was a big, big music freak. And I'd heard Ronnie Lane and people play, and that's what Glenn always struck me as a kind of a Ronnie Lane on him. It's a very fluid quality playing along with the chords, but making something interesting of the chords, he's kind of a certain melodic quality with the bass playing. So that really struck me. Steve Jones is a very powerful guitarist, and, and he had a real power that not many guitarists had got. A very exact player, you know. A lot of drummers would love to have to do, do that dust being their drumming, but in time with a real power and keep time. And so they, that's where they made that big impression. And I remember being like surprised, like, wow, they can really play. I saw the Pistols very early on at Chelsea Art School. I just knew this is something totally different. This is, it doesn't, it's not about the music, it's not about even what they're saying. The whole attitude, the whole vibe was, was something just squashes and flattens everything that's gone before. And it's, it's hard to put into words because there was nothing actually said about it, but it was absolutely clear as day that this is the beginning of a huge change. It totally spoke to me. And I remember I was wearing a brown leather jacket thinking, oh God, I shouldn't be wearing brown. You know, I just, there were just things suddenly that night that all clicked into place. We were never looking to hopefully see a good rock and roll band. You were looking and hoping to see the most dreadful and, and, and wonderful um, energy that could be best described as, you know, your first fuck, really. I don't have any heroes. They're all useless. I saw the Pistols at the 100 Club, supported by Suburban Stud. And Malcolm and asked me, uh, uh, told me to come down. So you've got a good boy, come see the band. And um, 
you know, Glenn's in it, because Glenn's working in the shop. And so I went, I, I went to see them, and although you couldn't actually hear any of their songs, just thought they were amazing. Just, I don't know, it's just the, the, the visual aspects and their attitude is what came over. Without ever hearing any of the music, they're, they're my new favourite band. It was wonderful. No, of course. People loved me. <laughs> they threw flowers. <laughs> Before the, the advent of punk, Diamond Club was a, a strong blues venue, a slightly fading jazz venue, and not a lot else in between. I was in a band myself, and um, one of my guitarists, Martin Stone, was in a, the London SS, a famous early prototype of punk. And he kept coming back to me and saying, all the guys talk about is clothes, how tight their trousers are and stuff like this. I said, well, you must be in your element. He said, yeah, but let's get, let's get some music too, you know. And uh, that really was a, how I got a glimmer of the start of punk. I put myself online to say that this is going to be a movement, a punk rock movement. And um, it was a kind of a tentative thesis. But on the other hand, if one could gather a whole lot of bands together and put on a festival, that was certainly going to confirm the fact that it was a movement which people were going to have to reckon with. You know, one band doesn't really make such a big difference. And so I was there for the planning. You know, there were all these bands that were coming together that Malcolm was organizing and putting up for Ron Watts, the owner of the 100 Club, to put on the bill. And they had this multicolored hair and they had clothes on which had been ripped to pieces and put back together with safety pins. And it was very bizarre. It's beyond anything that I'd seen. Well, the first time they played, uh, their audience turned out, the Bromley lot with the multicolored hair again and what have you. And it was good. We hadn't seen anything like it, and so we thought, well, we'll give it a try again. The Pistols had a residency at the 100 Club for some time, and that was starting to build, you know, and, and attract different people. The Clash came in a few times, first as the 101ers, and then when they changed the name to The Clash and supported the Pistols, and uh, that was very successful. <laughs> the Damned had emerged, and uh, I was involved with them, so I decided it was time for a, to go overground and do a big festival. And uh, I spoke to McLaren and he agreed, and so the Pistols, were, you know, I had to have the Pistols for that. The dam said yes, the Clash agreed, now to get a few others. People started to see them, and, that, and, you know, and then other bands started to, you know, kind of sp sprang off that. There was no punk movement. We've been there for five years or more, just waiting for this to happen, and now it's happened. It's not exactly a punk way of dressing, it's just dressing exactly how, you know, how you want to look, and finding clothes that are original, not like wearing everything that everyone else wears, you know. Myself and a few of my friends, we, when we talk about that, because people always dig the corpse of punk up to have another peek at it from time to time, and we kind of look, yeah, it was kind of fun, not to be taken that seriously. Musically, it wasn't, there wasn't a lot going on. It was like a kind of event happening that you probably had in New York lofts in the 60s or something. You get a certain period, and it's more about the, the event and the people and the personalities than it is about the actual music. I'd gone to see Queen in Hyde Park doing a free concert, believe it or not. And uh, I met Sue and Steve and a bunch of other people there. We got to sort of talking and they, I just said, no, I play guitar. And they sort of said, oh, do you want to go do a gig on Tuesday? And I said, all right. And he said, Malcolm's, uh, <coughs> Malcolm's uh, you know, kind of made us do this gig course. Of Su we're called Susan the Banshees, not S-U-Z-I and the Banshees. And, uh, we're going to do this gig and we haven't got a guitarist and uh, Sid's going to play drums. Sid Vicious on drums, Steve Spunker on bass, Marco on guitar and me just doing the vocals. Are you, are you a singer? Yeah. Had you sung before? Not on stage, no. I knew it was going to be a success because the queue went right round the block. Uh, Susie had come down, and Susie Sue from the Bromley contingent, looking amazing. And she got Sid together on drums and Steve Severin and uh, they got on the stage and basically none of them could play or do anything. It's just performance art. Sid was just about tapping the drums as lightly as he could. He seemed frightened of them. 
Sid was a pretty good drummer actually. Possibly technically not the best, but he could do it really loud and for a really long time. And it's really hard to play drums for 25 minutes. Sid drummed all the way through the Lord's Prayer, absolutely solid. He'd never touched drums before, he'd had about a 10 minute rehearsal before. And it was really, really impressive and he's very influenced by Gary Glitter and that sound. Um, so he played a very sort of jungly drumming sound all the way through. He never tried to get around the kit or anything, just lightly tapping it, like at a tea party with old ladies and things. You know. That was about it for them. Nothing really came out of it. They were on stage for what seems all night. Apparently it was only about 25 or 30 minutes. Sid was great, he just like smashed away like pure sort of glitter band stuff for 20 minutes and uh, and um, I remember Leiden came bounding to the front and jumped about causing the, you know, being very enthusiastic because of his mate Sid and uh, then it was all over and we walked back into the audience and we thought it was all, you know, that was the end of that. What did you sing? The Lord's Prayer via Twist and Shout, knocking on Heaven's Door, and a bit of Deutschland, Deutschland, do <laughs> And what went down the first? All of it. It got boring in some parts, but it picked up. They were getting up on stage, having not even really bothered to rehearse. And um, as brave and as wonderful as that was, um, it was obviously going to lead to a disappointment. And I think that's a very um, fulcrum of a lot of what was happening around punk. And it's all very well to have this swagger and this confidence and this outraged ability to want to get up on stage. But once you're on stage, you damn well better have something to say. And that takes a lot of hard work and rehearsal. There was always this kind of iron undercurrent to Sid. I mean, my personal view is, is that John had started getting some kind of degree of notoriety around then, or was in a band doing stuff and was the centre of attention, and Sid wanted to be the centre of attention, wasn't, and had to do something to create being the centre of attention, which was creating trouble. Sid always came down, yeah, with the, with the pistols. Um, I think it took him a bit by surprise, Andrew, because, because up until then, pistols had done virtually nothing. And this was the first inkling that uh, there could be some big success, you know. Yeah, he, in a way, he, he wanted to try and redirect attention to himself, I think. Because like, my mates are on the stage, but I'm here too. And he, he had this sort of bravara. And uh, he got up to a lot of noughties. On the first night of the punk festival, I was called from upstairs on the door. So Sid was misbehaving. So I came down through here to the dressing rooms. And Sid had taken out a knife and he was threatening the singer from the Sinky Toys, a girl called Ellie, with this knife. And he had to be disarmed and uh, I had to get actually got him down. Took the knife from him made him promise again to behave himself. I should have thrown him out, really, at that point. I took the knife, walked down here to the sound box, gave the knife to Milton McLaren, told him not to give it back to Sid. I wish I kept it myself, just to auction it, but I got a fortune. On the second night, through a pot, I think he was aiming at the damned on the stage over here. He was pretty drunk that night and he got egged on by, uh, by a few people like Vivian from, from Sex and stuff and, you know, uh, he decided he wanted to throw something at me. Threw the pot and it hit this central column here and it shattered. Me and Susie were standing with Sid and the damned were playing and none of us particularly liked the damned and he just... Uh, finished his, you know, his glass pint pot of beer and just lobbed it. Which didn't hit me, it hit the pillar in front of my face. And it shattered. And unfortunately, uh, it hurt a lot of people in the audience. And the result of it shattering, a young girl who was sat on the edge of the stage just beyond, was lost the sight of one eye, was blinded by a shard of the glass. Something 
had obviously gone wrong at the front and um, Dave and I think Brian stopped us playing, you know. Because it was kind of, it was a glass, it was kind of real menace. And somebody had actually really got hurt. This was a bit beyond sort of pretending to be tough. This was kind of, it was a nasty. About 12 policemen storm into the, the club, um, you know, throwing everything out of their way and grab Sid and drag him out of the club. I say to the police officers, what are you doing? Where are you taking him? And I'm brushed off by the police officer. And then I think I must have said, what the fuck are you doing? At which point I too am grabbed by the policeman and thrown into the car on top of Sid. And so there are Sid and I in the black of this police car being um, shipped to the police station. He was in Ashford. Remand Centre me and Susie went down to see him. I think we were the only people who did actually go and see him. He looked as though he'd caused enough of a fuss to get himself beaten up inside Ashford by somebody. So he was, he was feeling pretty sorry for himself when we saw him. But that was the kind of the beginning of his kind of uh, troubles, really. <laughs> on stage, spit at the audience and so on. I mean, how can this be a good example for children? Well, people are sick everywhere. People are sick and fed up with this country, telling them what to do. But not getting paid for it. Pardon? But not getting paid for putting on that sort of public show. Well, nor are we. We ain't even being allowed to play. Sid and I would go everywhere together, and one night we went to see the pistols at the screen on the green in Islington. I remember us standing at the back because we were still in the Flowers of Romance, and Sid saying, God, what is the point of being in a band? You know, this band has does it, done it all, they've said it all, they look great, they sound fantastic. There's, there's no, no way you can go after this. You know, they, they got there, and we can never sort of match them or be better than them or, or, or say anything that they hadn't already said. And honestly, a week later, he was asked to be in the Pistols. And he rang me up and said, you know, what do you think? And I said, totally go for it. And they got rid of Glenn and got Sid in. It was difficult, because first of all, Glenn and John weren't getting on anyway. So that wasn't going to work last for much longer. So somebody had to come in. But there was a lot of reasons why it made sense. But also, at the same time, you sort of thought, well, is that the right thing to do? And don't forget, you know, I'd always thought of Sid as being much more of a front man than a, than a bass player. And besides, who'd want to give Sid, Sid something big and heavy you could swing around? <laughs> There's a whole load of history, what was going on within the band, who was doing what and not doing what, and who was putting ideas in and who wasn't putting ideas in. And we had this real kind of ongoing unit, but as soon as some of the people in the band got their boat race in the papers, it tended to change a bit, and it changed the whole kind of balance of the band and created lots of problems. There was a hell of a lot of friction there. And, and how can I put this? It, you know, my, my position just became a bit untenable because I wouldn't put up with a lot of the stuff. And there was a lot of politics going on. I mean, John joined the band. He was the last one to join the band. I think, as he saw it, he thought it was Steve, Paul and me against him. But it wasn't. You, you know Steve and Paul. Like, Steve and Paul, to me, were like a bit of a double act, like Fred Flintstone and Barney Rubble kind of vibe going on. I can push him. <laughs> They was there, I was there, and then John was there. So there was this kind of triumvirate kind of thing. So there was a balance, but John didn't realise that. He wanted to get his mate in uh, to even it all up. I don't know uh, if Malcolm and John manoeuvred Sid uh, Glenn out. I think they just told him to fuck off, is what I thought. I think. I mean, it was quite. It, I mean, I think they just made life, uh, Glenn's life hell. So he, he couldn't, couldn't. It wasn't worth it anymore. It wasn't worth being in this band anymore. Um, and what he would have done to see that he, he, he was just over the moon. People would remember that we, everyone was very young. I mean, how old was he at the time? Maybe 19, 20, I think. You know, when you're a kid, you do kind of, um, you know, you believe what, what you're perceived to be. 
when I saw him at Louise's, it was like, oh, I don't tell him, I remember, uh, I'm going to join the Pistols. And I was like, oh, yeah, what? Yeah, all the joint, you know, it's like really kind of, you know. And uh, then, of course, he did that, had that conversation with just about everyone in the club that night. <laughs> This was like his first outing as a pistol. He was proud of it, he loved the pistols. Everything they stood for and everything else. I saw them about, I think about a week after they'd actually signed. They did a concert at Green on the Green at Islington. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. You know, the whole of London was there, okay? When I talk about the whole of London, I'm saying like, you know, genres from every little facet of London. And everybody came out and they were the dog's bollocks. They were brilliant. And Sid just stood there the whole evening and tried to play the bass as best he could. It was a brilliant concert. I think the only rule I ever had, if it didn't annoy anyone, it wasn't worth doing. If it didn't create problems too, it was also not worth doing. From that, it then had to have a lot of style and be sexy to sell. I think Malcolm knew straight away that Sid was going to be the kind of figurehead, the focus of it, because he, he had the look completely down, even though it was, you know, no one knew it was the look, but he had that kind of charisma that it all worked on him, whatever they, they put on him, it worked. He probably had more of a sort of malleable personality that uh, he could be guided a bit by Malcolm. I think that's why Malcolm wanted him in the band, because obviously he was always going to have a rougher time trying to deal with Leiden, because Leiden was much more his own man. I mean, you could tell straight away Sid was like, you know, going to be the, the icon. <laughs> did always look good. I mean, just, just physics didn't really matter what he wore. I mean, physically, he looks good. He's a very attractive in a really base way. And it, that really was very much part of how they were, all of them. They had, had that kind of quality in slightly, slightly different ways. His look just became that easy punk look. The identikit, all your mates can do it so you're safe, because so you're in a gang kind of punk look. Sid started off with black spiky hair, quite long, and sort of ripped t-shirts and sort of um, 50s peg trousers with brothel creepers, quite bright coloured brothel creepers, but all a bit shabby. I mean, it didn't look normal. It was all ripped and torn. He stood out from the crowd and you couldn't miss him. And he liked being, he liked the notoriety of it, and obviously he pretended he didn't, but he, he loved it, you know. He, he, he wanted to be famous. <laughs> Sid came back from sex, Vivian Westwood's shop one day, and he'd gone with the peg trousers and the brothel creepers and the torn shirt, and he had sort of black jeans on, different shoes, and he said that Vivian had burnt his pegs and said he's not, you know, he's not ever to dress like that again, he looks rubbish, and he, and he was just totally sort of reborn with his hair short and everything. He looked great, but he looked harder. What I did was show kids how to do their own clothes, so they don't have to buy those things. They can take an old T-shirt and change it and make it theirs, or, if they, if they really want to, they can come and, um, and, and buy something here. And I actually think it's very good value for money because I um, rely on English craftsmen to make things for me. And I think that um, people do appreciate what they're actually paying for. It was very interesting to see in the early days this kind of very put together, homemade punk image with second-hand suits and um, re real second-hand ripped jumpers. And, how, and with Sid, you know, when you first see him, you know, I mean, we see all those young fans. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of tentative. But then when it so obviously worked, and it was so, it, there was obviously a whole generation of people empathizing with that look, um, then it became much more polished. And then, of course, um, Malcolm and Vivian were kind of commercializing that look and it became more polished and more exaggerated. I think he just wore it so well. It was very simple. It's, it's like James Dean, you know, white t-shirt, leather jacket. 
and the hair and and the face. I mean, without the face, this bloke with the leather jacket. But but that um, he just you know he, he got that style and he got it down right. Sid's the bloke. He's got his iconic image and the lowest common denominator look, unfortunately, very much for worse as well as for better. My heart sinks a bit, because it's like, ooh, you know, I remember all these dour, gormless blokes, you know, wading up and down King's Road, circa 79, when it was all over anyway, with black spiky hair, boots, and you know, dumbed down. And I actually, to be honest, the side of Sid, I was never comfortable with that. It's, it's deliberately dumbing down. His look really never changed. I mean, he, I always thought he was handsome. I always thought he cut a, an amazing figure. And although I can only say this in hindsight, I actually thought that he would sort of like go on to bigger and better things. He had the look. A lot of fashion people came in, photographers came in to sort of take snaps of all of us because it, you know, we were the hip and happening youngsters at the time. And they would always gravitate towards Jordan or Sid Vicious. And I can see why, because they just had that unique look that no one else had at that particular time. He was just startlingly beautiful. I mean, youth is always beautiful. So he was this teenager. But he just had, you know, me with my artist's eye, um, just saw a kind of an aesthetic beauty in his face, which was really kind of breathtaking. He was one of those people when you, if you saw walking down the street, if, or if you saw in a crowd, you know, he, for a moment, you know, he takes your breath away. He, you know, you would gasp at the beauty, and he's, you know, you, you would say, you know, he burned your eyes. He was so beautiful. Rutten always customised stuff. I mean, give him something, you know, he'll work it, or he'll, he'll wear it with something, and it worked. And uh, Rutten went through a whole. He had the same look, but but there were different clothes each time. But Sid arrived at that, and that's what he wore. And it seems, you know, you look at the pictures and stuff, and it's like, well, he's put that on, and he hasn't taken it off for three years. At that time, it was a reaction to the, the Anarchy tour, where they couldn't play in England. Um, plus, the idea was to give the band an opportunity to rehearse together, perfectly judged really, because they really enjoyed it and Sid really got into it, really, well, developed his, uh, his role. I've been told by people that sort of helped Sid out and sort of showed him, you know, one end of a bass and out of tune it and all that sort of stuff. And the word really is that he, you know, was a pleasant pupil to teach, but seemed to find music beyond him. He had a, he gave himself a, himself a hard time really, because he really wanted not to do bass as, as it had been known. He kind of wanted to reinvent the instrument, um, and he he had this idea that the Ramones uh, um, his sound was the what sound he wanted to have, which is probably not really as harmonic as the Pistols one. One night in Davis Road, um, it was late, I went to bed. I, the Ramones album had just come out, we got it that day and everyone was lo really looking forward to it. And we'd listened to it and it was amazing, but it, it just so wasn't a girl thing. I mean, I, I could appreciate it and thought it was fantastic. It was like a new way of listening and hearing stuff. And it was groundbreaking, but it you know, what didn't sort of speak to my heart, but it really spoke to Sid. So I went to bed and when I woke up in the morning, he could play bass. He just sat in the bedroom next door with that record over and over and over and over again. And he had a fantastic ear. He did have a really good ear. He was a really bright guy. And uh, he just picked up all the bass lines. He knew every song, could play the bass by the morning. In time, you know, picked up. He'd never touched an instrument really before. She couldn't play bass. I mean, man, who gave a shit? We used to turn him down important. in the mix. Yeah, yeah. 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 sometimes we used to turn him off, actually. We'd class all the dials on the M. And says, we do that for <laughs> Don't worry, Sid, you don't <laughs> need to worry about playing bass. You just keep talking to the girls. He really didn't care. I don't know if Sid could have been a better musician. I don't think it was really... Uh, I don't think that was what he was about, really. I don't think he really wanted... He, he, I don't think he really cared. As I understand it, I think I'm right in saying that Captain showed uh, Sid how to play the bass at first, or showed him some chords and stuff. Because Captain always complained that he copied his sneer when he played as well, because Captain was always on that uh, thing, you know. Originally, he wasn't able to actually play them, but they, I mean, but bass is not a, well, a lot of people might, might argue with me, but it's not a very difficult job. People think that playing bass is easy because you've got four strings. 
which was the kind of mistake that we all made in punk. Like we always gave the bass, bass we always gave. There was always like you know three guys could play and their mate who couldn't play. So who he was played bass, and it's the same thing you know with Sid. You know it's, that's traditional way it happened. He'd found his way around the notes and he'd written you know it, it, it's the same sort of thing. He had the you know the notes written on the bass guitar and then Paul, Paul Simonon had the notes written on his bass guitar. You can see them in early Clash photographs. Had he got through the first album, had the Pistols ever made the second album, and had Sid stayed clean, I, I think he would have started turning into a real bass player. And the same, same way as, John, as Jar Wobble. I mean, he wasn't a bass player to start off with, but he became a real bass player. He wasn't really musical. I don't think that was ever what it was about. I think for, for, you know, for his side of things, it, it wasn't about it. He wasn't a musician. Um, you know, he, he used to say to me, because I used to do these half-time kind of bass lines, and, um, and, he, and he'd say that shit, and, I, and then he'd I'd look and he'd do the Ramones. It was all, of his, playing the bass was about slinging it low and sneering, you know, and, um, and, I, and I used to say, Sid, you're shit, you can't play. So it was always having conversations, you know, it's just say, you're hopeless, you're really hopeless. And, it, and then it said, but then it would, to be fair, Sid would then say, oh no, I think it's good to be hopeless, and I say, yeah, actually, it is good to be hopeless. Isn't being hopeless great? So we'd have one of those. And uh, those kind of conversations. Sid was a fantastic singer. He had a real presence, he had a great voice. What he didn't have, though, was he didn't have that kind of lyrical stance that, that John had. So that was his downfall, but he, but he looked the part. just like a normal guy. I mean, you know, very funny. People never realised he had a great sense of humour. He was always saying jokes. I mean, some of them were, <laughs> you know, obviously at everyone's expense, but it didn't matter because there's always like he was a gentle soul underneath it. Um, what you saw on stage and what you read about in the newspapers was not the Sid that really was in truth. Um, I had a long talk with his mother about this at one point, and she always said that he was very like that when he was a child anyway. He was very, you know, very happy, very good, very good at mixing with people. I always describe him as a lovable bozo, up, up until he became a pistol. He was a, uh, he had this sort of dopey sense of humour, which, which was fun. It, 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 was, it was fun to be around. When I first met Sid, he was an absolute sweetie. He was kind of bashful and sort of sheepish, and he always had this sort of sheepish air about him. He would be sweet. I mean, he'd get his dole, and I'd go off to art school in the mornings, and he'd say, oh, you know, let me come and spend the day with you at art school. And I'd say, no, no way. He said, I'll, I'll buy you breakfast. Cause we were always broke, so I would say, OK, then. And he'd come and sit with me all day at art school, when, and I was doing fashion and textiles. And he'd sit next to me, burping and farting until in the end they couldn't stand it any longer and you know begged me to never bring him again and because he, he, he would take the mickey out of it all you know he <laughs> he thought it was funny and he thought it was stupid and he just had nothing to do all day he used to sit there with his long legs splayed out and sort of leather jeans just making horrible noises <laughs> the end of our relationship was at the scala cinema the slits had played and afterwards, uh, Sid was on stage. I mean, not you know, the gig was over, but there was, a, there was Sid and uh, three kids, and they were just playing. And I just thought, you know, punk with kids. Anyway, so I shot some pictures. Uh, about half an hour later, he, I think he was in the bar or something, he just pinned me against the wall. Never take a picture of me unless I say so. Well, that's untenable. So I just kept out of his way from there on. Wobble was standing just there. I mean, I would have considered going back on him, um, but I would never mess with Wobble. I can remember he was a really funny, funny bloke with a really funny sense of humour, but I also remember him as already having a very needy junkies mentality. For a bloke who took the mick a lot and was really not sneering and not caring, actually he really did care very much and in a way really wanted to play the game. When we talk about Sid, we have to talk about the violence which is implicit in his character. I do know that he absolutely was desperate for attention. And I don't think attention-seeking is per se a bad thing. Um, 
And actually attention seeking is a desire for approval and a desire for love. And I don't think when you have a teenager's desire for approval and love is either a bad thing. Um, however, children who are brutalized as children kind of cope with that by anesthetizing their senses. And so to have any feelings at all, those feelings tend to be extreme. Fid was always getting into trouble way before the pist he was joined the Pistols. I mean, he and I would hang out to together, a boy and a girl. You know, you couldn't think of anything less threatening. We'd go out to say the Royal College um, dance or something. In you know, and we'd always end up running away from people wanting to kill us because of Sid being mouthy. He'd get his belt off and just smash someone. I don't know how it happened. He, I don't know if he wanted to draw arguments to him or people because they didn't like the look of him and he looked different and he looked hard kept trying to take him on all the time but in the end that's why I wore Dr Martins because we were constantly running away from fights. Bar at the Handra Club and this is the famous spot where Sid, Sid Vicious, attacked Nick Kent right here and uh, I was called to, to help um, Nick was not in a very good state, he was quite shaken. I picked up Sid, held him up in the air, made him promise to be a good little boy, and he wasn't. I see that's the first occasion down here where Sid really misbehaved. In the marquee, he bashed Billy Idol, just smacked him around the face, and Billy hit him back. I thought it was so funny. Uh, Sid said to him, I really respect you for doing that. <laughs> Just don't get it. He wasn't even that comfortable around women, actually. He was very awkward around women and girls. He, he wasn't comfortable. He probably was most comfortable amongst a couple of lads, you know, like Lydon and John Wardle. He was probably most comfortable in that setting. But, I mean, he hung out with me all the time, but it was always a little bit awkward and stiff between us, even though we were together every day, you know. So, you know, he wasn't comf comfortable with women and he couldn't... I never saw him get off with anyone. Basically, he crashed at my place most of the time and we would share the bed. And um, most nights he would wet the bed and you'd wake up in the morning with a soaking mattress and it would smell like pure Newcastle brown ale. He, he, that's, he used to drink it, you know, <laughs> and he would just piss it out during the night. I mean, and, and then I'd say, Sid, what, what have you done? You've done it again. And he would just laugh sheepishly. I mean, he, he was kind of sweet and charming, funnily enough. He, you know, he was sweet, but he was very sort of innocent in many ways, and he would never try it on, no. As a young person who is not allowed to have sex or finds it difficult to approach other people to have sex for the intensity of love and sex, it is much easier to get an intensity of feeling by being violent to either yourself or to other people. Now, this to me is typical of Sid. So he is hurting himself, covered with welts and burns, to get the kind of intensity of feeling. But also, he is being encouraged by adults around him. For instance, Vivian Westwood and Malcolm LeCaron, whose political position is that it is good to destroy and be violent because, by the way, after you've destroyed and been violent to people, you might have something happening. I saw Sid once and uh, he, it was a joke he made. It's like, I said, What did you do last night? Oh, you was around at this party and then I, was, uh, I, sl I slashed my wrist with a bottle, so no one, but no one noticed, so I did it again. And we all laughed. And, but it, it was in, on that sort of thing. You know, he, just, he, he did it to like, look at me, I'm weird. And it was the same with the cigarettes, you know, stabbing out cigarettes. The whole point of theatre is to act out scenarios of violence and confrontation of corrupt establishments. But if you are so stupid or dangerous or irresponsible to bring that theater of violence onto the street and attack your own people, then it is going to add, end in disaster. I work in the business, I'm Sid's manager, and I know. Well, 
I met Nancy before he did, I was at the Heartbreakers. She just arrived in England that day. And uh, she'd come to England looking for Jerry Nolan. And um, it was my birthday, and I thought Heartbreakers had played at the Speakeasy, I'd come her back. And she was there, Johnny Thunders was there, smacked out of their, both of them I think were probably smacked out of their head. I just remember my first impression of her, she was very loud. One of those people that was, you know, she had that awful voice that was all grated on you. The record companies are, are scraping the bottom of the barrel to, to sign up punk groups. As soon as he got involved with that, you know, it was a problem and then, then that Nancy Spongeon turned up and then she was the right daggy boiler, as they say in Australia. She was bad news. Nancy Sprungen was magnificent. And why, one of the reasons why she's magnificent is because she had all the hotspur and self-confidence of an American young woman. Now, Sid found it very difficult to approach British or English young women who wouldn't pick up, you know, who are, who are going to say, who are, who are kind of very reticent. Um, but here was this luscious, delicious, blonde, beautiful young woman who, who's got no qualms at coming up to him. And I think he likes her self-confidence. It fits in very well with A, what he wants, and his kind of shyness. I never had a problem with Nancy. I liked her. I, I, she, made, you know, she was a groupie. She got what she wanted, but when she did, she made sure that Sid was, was happy, and they got on really well. I, I honestly think their relationship was as true as it could possibly be. Ow! Oh, Sid, damn you! Fuck! She's awful. Totally awful. Just squawky, awful. I don't know, there was just, just something, you know. Um, I mean, I, I, I'd never... I never got to know her because I didn't want to get to know her. My IQ happens to be 172. I graduated high school when I was 15 for your fucking information. She was just like a loud, horrible New York junkie, you know, and with, with everything that entails, the lies, the stealing. I saw him on the Pistols boat trip. He was Nancy Spudgeon, who I didn't like one little bit. She looked really, a really dirty little scruffy tart. But love is blind, you know. They probably deserved each other. I don't know. I think Sid is hot. Okay, well, you check him out well, later. Well, you better keep your fucking hands off him, dear. Oh, yeah, I'll man. <laughs> oh, yes. Hello, you alive. It was a surprise to me that um, Sid would ever get himself in a situation where he was strung out at all. I cannot really give it any other basis for having happened other than, than Nancy. You know, I kind of have a picture of him literally spoon feeding him. Like Sid would have died up to 15 deaths if I hadn't been around. Because that's just, you know, the way he is. I mean, he's not, this is what he does when he's not with me. I don't really go along with the line that's put out by um, the men and the boys about Nancy Sprungen. For all Sid's front, for all his violence and his torturing animals and everything else, Actually, he's a very lucky, he lacks self-confidence, he's very shy. So here is Nancy Sprungen offering herself and all her pulchritude. And so it was like, a, you know, a very good match. And had the rest of the men around them not been so vile about women in general, there was nobody to say to Sid, you know, lucky you. Then in fact, there was a lot of jealousy because Sid was actually so beautiful he could almost have anything he wanted, male or female. People would put Sid down for his sexual prowess because they were so jealous of it. And so there was another, there was another little avenue of hope that could have helped him, but it was closed down by misogyny and jealousy. She was definitely after getting one of them. And from what I've heard is that she slept away through maybe Steve. I think she, um, Rotten wasn't interested in her and she, somehow she ended up with Sid. I can't, I can't help the eighth it. Time you I'm speak, just so tired and warm. Spill cigarette on me, spill coffee on me, spill orange juice on me. He did what he thought to, was cool to fit into whatever little kind of thing he was into, and that's not to say that he was a he didn't have a, he didn't have a personality. He did. He had a big he had a strong personality, but not as strong as the people that he kind of like, you know, followed around.
And then, of course, the worst role model you could get was Johnny Thunders, obviously, which is where the heroin came in. Once they had turned him onto heroin, that was it. I mean, he was he was not Sid was a great joiner in. He was he was not he was not the sort of person to say, "Hey, no, let's I, that's enough for me." Just say no. Who's going to say yes to anything? The concert was a sellout. Not surprising, since the promoters picked a hall that could seat less than 500. It attracted those who believe that punk rock is all about safety pin jewellery, the just plain curious, and the costume wearers, seeking some publicity of their own. Takings at the bar exceeded those at the box office as the pistols made a fashionably delayed appearance. But suddenly, there they were. Malcolm was very cagey about America. I don't think that the Pistols really saw anything to be gained out of America. They didn't really see it as a natural um, progression of any kind. Actually, they quite considered, uh, he kind of, if anything, considered it not to be, you know, sort of alien. Or, yeah. um, for Malcolm, it was very much about um, the next kind of business. Detectives from Atlanta's Vice Squad were in the audience, fearing the group might unleash something unutterably obscene. All they got was a bare chest, a lot of beer swigging, a few four-letter words from Johnny Rotten, and lyrics that might or might not have been objectionable. Forty-five minutes later, the Sex Pistols' first American concert was over. Ahead of them, appearances in Texas and California. What did you think of the, uh, of the they Sex Pistols? They were great. They were great. If I could only make out the words, they'd be greater. First day of the tour in Atlanta, Georgia, and this is when I met him. And then I went back to the hotel room after I checked in, and uh, we started to talk about his music, about the show, and about the press. And he started laughing about the English press, how you know they have to hide from them, you know they don't want to deal with them. And I, so I got him to be. I was talking to him almost as a one-to-one -one on a friend. He got relaxed, and I said, well, you know, I'm going to start shooting. He said, yeah, whatever, you know, and I aimed the camera, and he was, uh, he had a dr drink in his hand, and I started shooting. That was one of the frames that I got, and I really liked this shot because it captures a moment in his life where he's just plain Sid. To counter the Sex Pistols' reputation for not giving interviews, bass player Sid Vicious came out to tell reporters a little bit about his personal background. When I was 13, when I was 12, I was just a kid. When I was 13 to 15, I was a skinhead. From 15 to 20, I've been a punk. When he got to America, he was in a bit of a rough state, actually. So he kind of wanted to meet American fans to get what he was looking for, which was get stoned. I think most of everybody else just thought they were freaks, actually. I think they're uh, sickening and disgusting. I... There are 1980s, an expression we need. Our first fashion expression for the 80s. The motivation, the kind of mission for the, for the Sex Pistols was to leave the 70s. And that these Americans had kind of left it, but they're still looking like it. They were still left, there was half of it still intact. It was like a sort of uh, the living dead. It was, <laughs> they were sort of half. Um, still done up uh, like uh, Roxy Music. It was awful loud, <laughs> it was, you know, real loud. It, it sounded like rock and roll along, you know, a few years ago and listened to punk rock. Groom flinched there because somebody uh, had yeah. just spit on him. Maybe that's what punk rock is about, spitting yeah, on people. Maybe so. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't know what to say now. This shot has a great story behind it. It's in was in Texas, and it was a, a general admission show where there's no seats. So I stood in the second row, kind of, and there was somebody in front of me, and the guy in front of me started throwing things at Sid and cursing him out for no reason. I mean, I'm standing there, I'm watching. There was nothing provoking him to do this. He was just being a jerk, and after he was doing it for like 15 minutes, and Sid. So, you know, it started hitting Sid with cans, you know, and it was like, okay, enough is enough. 
Sid took the neck, his guitar off, took the neck and swung it at him because he wanted to beat him with it. The guy ducked, and of course, me standing right in back of it, got hit with the guitar. Sid freaked out, and the first thing I remember saying is, I'm okay, don't worry, just keep playing, you know? And Sid said, okay, cool, you know? And I turned around, I'm like, oh, that hurt. <laughs> The whole thing had really start, started off badly and never got any better. The hardest thing was, was, was dealing with Sid, but I mean, everybody else had their needs as well. And as far as the, the bottom line is concerned, how the group um, performed, um, that was really suffering. And that really affected them in a way uh, that I hadn't seen. And in the, I mean, because it had never been a problem. It's, and that to, for that to become a problem was really a sort of below the belt and was pretty hard work for everybody. I remember the tension that they all went through because of the amount of press. And they were able to handle it to a point. I mean, you know, thinking about how old they were, putting that into consideration. But all in all, f to go from one city to another and being invaded by the press, both national and international, is, you know, could do something to your head, you know, and he was able to keep it on there, you know, and I was surprised. In fact, I was happy to see that. San Francisco, really, it was probably the best gig they did. They had a chance to wind down and kind of um, collect themselves. But the thing about San Francisco, unfortunately, was that Malcolm had decided that John was being a pre and uh, and he was acting up on it, or he cut himself off. It was uh, the, day, the next day when they had a meeting, um, and Malcolm told John that he wasn't in the band anymore. To hear that John had been fired by Malcolm and Steve, just the weirdest, most improbable conclusion to the whole thing. They all had to leave America, otherwise Warners uh, were going to be penalised. And I had to get Sid back to London. And the next flight was an overnight to, to New York and change in New York. Unfortunately, um, Sid had uh, arranged to get um, Valium through a doctor in Los Angeles. Um, and uh, he took, I don't know, two of these uh, uh, before the flight. But it had uh, too much. He was lying in the, in the first class uh, chair uh, at the front of the plane, um, with the rest of the passengers sort of filing out of the plane past him, snoring his head off. Um, and I was unable to wake him up, and the stewardess was putting ice cubes down the back of his neck and saying that that was the way to do it, and somebody else was trying to wake him up. He was literally snoring his head off. He was fine when he woke up. I mean, and he, he probably um, had probably taken more Valiums than, than had been prescribed. Malcolm was vicious. Malcolm would have pushed him down any fucking road, excuse my French, that was, you know, bad or... He didn't care as long as it sold records. Malcolm had sent over the, uh, a song script, okay, the songs he wanted to, to do. And it, you know, okay, I fought the law and the law won, which The Clash did. Fuck off, Mick Jones. Um, that was on there, plus a bunch of others. YMCA was on there. <laughs> Can you imagine Sid doing YMCA? But anyway, um, no, of course he would. His problem was not to be go down the road sort of like of an Alvin Stardust or something. It's surprising for me that we managed to get quality out of it. Sid's recording of the, both of the Eddie Crockett songs was, you know, was really only done in a couple of takes. I'm one session, there was Nancy was there in the production room. It was horrible to do. I mean, how can one person make something horrible? Well, just dealing with Sid, not dealing with the person that I had developed a, uh, a friend, which a friendship with, a relationship with, a work relationship with, dealing with having to deal with Nancy and uh, aspiring to be his manager. It was a struggle. Yeah, he provided a fair amount. 
of energy, but it was only half. It was, you know, he, he had far more potential. And that wasn't very satisfying to be working with him on that basis at all. As much as I love, you know, my way and I love all that, um, I don't think, I think he would have been found out sooner or later and I think that would have hit him. But I think he would have had a great life, you know, like the rest of them, you know. You know he could have got back together every so often doing little, you know, memorial concerts. <laughs> Now, Bank Dad was a blast, isn't he? Good riff. When we did this gig, we were just casting around for songs to do. I said, you want to do my way? No, I don't want to do that. Uh, do Belson? Uh, I don't know, I'm not sure about the words. People don't get it. And I said, what do you mean people don't get it? And he said, well, people think it's kind of like literal, but I meant it to be, uh, um, I said, ironic. And he said, yeah, it's supposed to be ironic, but people don't get it. He was reading some book and it was, on a postcard that some German had written to somebody. And he just literally... Belson was a gas I read the other day, you know, so he... Because he was going to America, and because we were not supposed to be mates, we were sitting in a pub, and Sid said, well, how can we prove it? I said, well, why don't we do a gig? And we actually think we did this thing called The Vicious White Kids. It was just like a one-off show. Steve New from The Rich Kids played guitar. Brett Scabies played drums. He was in a band called The White Cats at the time. So what was we going to call it? It was Sid Vicious. We was in The, the Rich Kids, so The Kids bit, and The White Cats, so The Vicious White Kids, just for a laugh. And that was it. And we did this one-off show, and it was great. Glenn and Sid had come up with the thing of doing the gig anyway. And I'd been out on tour with Glenn doing like with the white cats opening for the rich kids and stuff so we, we knew each other pretty well and we all got on all right so it seemed like so when it came to doing it, it you know glenn asked me if i wanted to we called it sid sods off i think was the the working title yeah we played everything twice because we went and um did the set and then we came off stage and we're all telling each other how great we were and Somebody came on and said, you know you've only been on stage for 20 minutes, don't you? You've got to go and do some more, and we didn't have any more, so we went back out and did it all again, but this time with Nancy singing on backing vocals. We did this gig, and because he was going to the States the very next day or the day after, we billed it as Sid Sods Off. And I said, oh, well, you might as well take the money for the show, you know, to help him on his way. I only found out about a year ago, the bloke who got the gig together and managed it, I said, what happened to the money for that show? And he said, well, you said, we'll give it to Sid. I said, well, how much was it? He said, 12 grand. I said, oh, no, me and my big mouth. But him going to New York with 12 grand in his back pocket, I don't think it did him any good in the long run. So I'm sorry about that, and I wish I'd had my cut. I think he just needed money to go to America. Him and Nancy were kind of an item, and I think that that was what you know, that's where he saw himself going. And I can't remember, but I think he'd already had done all right with a couple of records here at that time, hadn't he? He'd had like a number one even, wasn't it? And so it's actually quite a logical thing for him to go to America, I think, you know, once you crack England, you do. And so I don't think there was a, it was like a career move. I think Sid had just found himself in a place where he knew that that was what he could do and that was how he could survive. Sid, you're going to be a big star in the States. <laughs> I mean, give us a break. But, you know, at the same time, it was like, you know, three, four thousand dollars in your pocket. Even more, excuse me. You know, it was probably more than that. It was probably like about seven, eight, nine thousand dollars in your pocket every night. So not bad. Why not see him with Nancy? Sydney! She would always be called Sydney! You know, Chelsea Cloisters and all that, you know, I remember seeing him around there and, um, you know, it was just boring. You know, what goes on with a junkie? My best pal become a junkie. What goes on with junkies? Junkies are not interesting. They become a complete and utter drag. So there was nothing going on. And, um, you know, it was just, he became somebody you just disregarded. And uh, you just become a nuisance. It was impossible to separate him from Nancy. So, really, I, I just threw my hands up. And wished him all the 
All the best. And hoped you'd come back. I expected him to come back. Today, police received a call from the Chelsea Hotel on West 24th Street. In room one, a man said that he was sitting on the bed near his picture. In the bathroom, there was the 20-year-old American girl who looked like him for years. Nancy Pine Spongen had been stabbed to death. Room was uh, very bloody. There was blood on the sheets and blood on the mattress. There was tracks of blood leading into the bathroom where the body of the female was found lying under the sink and she was stabbed in the stomach. I wish that I could have gone there and given him some sort of support. It was just such a sad situation. I, I always knew he never murdered uh, Nancy. I just knew it. I mean, there was just no way he would. Um, so it had to be a terrible accident. I feel vindicated by that. But of course, the tabloid press just went for him in a big way because he was selling newspapers. It was meant to happen. Nancy always said she'd die before she was 21. <coughs> The victim, Nancy Spungen of Philadelphia, was found in the singer suite at the Chelsea Hotel. He's been charged with second-degree murders. To watch Sid Vicious, this hopeful, exuberant, enthusiastic teenager, become such a fulcrum of hatred and condemnation, and then ultimately destroying himself and other people, and becoming um, this murderer, it's a tragedy, and personally, what, you know, one just feels um, very great sadness. What would you like to happen now over the next, say, year or two? <coughs> I'd like to have fun. What sort of fun? Any kind of fun, just fun. That's my object in life. Are you having fun at the moment? Are you kidding? No, I'm not having fun at all. Where would you like to be? Under the ground. I didn't think Sid had done it. You know, I knew him really well. Uh, I, I knew he could be out of it, and I knew she was someone who could push you to the limits. You know, she utterly goaded and pushed people to their limits anyway, drove you to distraction actually with her whining and moaning. But, um, and, you know, if it, if it had been him, then it, then it would have been done in such a sort of understandable way that it wasn't like a murder, if you know what I mean. So there, there was no way I thought, oh, Sid, how could you have done that? I knew it had either been such an extreme, druggy, insane situation or that some, someone else, they'd got caught up in some deal and someone else had done it. But I, I didn't, you know, I, I totally... I'm with Sid as a good person, really. Sid Vicious will not have to stand trial for the murder of a girlfriend at the Chelsea Hotel. Sid is no longer vicious, he's dead. His nude body found in a Greenwich Village apartment, spoon and syringe nearby. The heroin overdose may have been accidental. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. A friend had gone. You know, somebody I knew had died, you know, it's... And way too young. He told me. After we did that show, we had a sort of farewell drink one lunchtime in my local. And he said to me, he said, I'll be dead by the time I'm 21. I said, get out of it, being that kind of bloke. But he was, so he was right. I was really, really sad when, when Sid died. I mean, it really affected me badly, but even though it felt utterly inevitable to me, there was, again, no shock that this had happened. He was absolutely careering towards that end. There was no shock. So, in a way, I was surprised at how very sad I felt about it. And, you know, you reflect on a person's life when they die. And, and you know, he, he was a good guy with an intelligent brain, so much going for him, and yet he'd careered down this path. Sid Vicious, a British punk rocker, became famous by being well-known. Certainly not for his music, perhaps for his public obscenities, anti-social statements and vulgarities. He hardly scraped the surface of his potential, that's for sure. I wish things had worked out differently. I wish things, uh, uh, and I, you know, that certain people hadn't turned up when they did and so on. But, and, and I certainly wouldn't have the idea that uh, 
that Sid had some kind of death wish. That certainly isn't the case. Vicious shot up some heroin, and he had a reaction to it, which he came out of about 45 minutes later. And then about 2 o'clock, he lay down to go to sleep. All they know for now is that he had been asleep with companion Michelle Robinson at the time of his death. She's an unemployed actress who was hustled away from the scene along with the victim's mother as the crowd of curious and neighbors grew inside. We often think, oh, I should have done something, I should have said something. But I mean, what could you do? You know, what could you say? And, you, you, and, and had they been around you, you wouldn't want to, you just want them to be as dead as fast as possible. Oh, my God. Oh, my. Donna Florio lived just across the hall from the apartment in which the singer died. But she would not say whether she was among the eight people who attended last night's party for Sid Vicious. All these people who said they were with him on the last night, at his big party over and his mother had organized this party and she was going to do all this stuff, bullshit. There was like Michelle, his new girlfriend, me on my own, and his mother. And that's all that was there from like about six in the evening until three, four in the morning. So all these people who go on about the big Sid Vicious party on the night before he died, they're liars. Sid got dragged, pulled down into that sort of dark vortex. And, and one of the bad aspects of that whole kind of punk scene, the whole thing surrounding McLaren and the pistols, nobody was willing to play the, the role, I noticed, of elder brother, let alone father figure. If you'd stepped forward, if anyone, those older people had stepped forward and said, listen, son, arm around the shoulder, you know, you're going down a bit of a bad path here, or somebody to have the gravitas, the, the bollocks to step in and stop a situation. But they say that would never have happened because that would have been made the person bourgeois. It's very easy to ask that question of um, what, who could have helped Sid? What, what could have prevented this disaster? And I don't think there was anybody who could have done it. If anything had, wanted, had saved Sid, it would have been an absolute coincidence and by chance, um, enabled by his own desire to save himself. Um, and I just wonder whether Sid hated himself so much that he didn't have the, you know, he didn't really, he wasn't figuring out alternatives or ways of surviving. Sid was one of those guys, you could see it right from the beginning, he was destined for disaster, I think, you know. Was, and some people are. I, didn't th I, I was amazed he lasted out as long as he did, really, I suppose, on the kind of the, the direction he decided to take his life in. I think I was very upset because the person I knew, I didn't think he'd be capable of doing something like that. Um, if he hadn't met Nancy, I think he probably would probably still be alive today. Our history would be completely rewritten. But I think it's, you know, that you, 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 people experience the way they interact with each other. And I think if you hadn't met Nancy, maybe this would, well, I'm sure it wouldn't have happened. Police say they were told by the victim's girlfriend that his last hours were spent looking toward the future. He was speaking about his future. The conversation with his girlfriend was about his future. And it appears from the conversation he didn't want to uh, do away with himself. What sort of future was he contemplating? I have no idea. It was an accident. He had no intention of doing himself in. And if um, I'm to believe anything that he said to me that particular evening, um, he, um, he was more concerned with clearing his name. He was not in a suicidal mood or, you know, I'm going to kill myself, I'm fed up with everything, or some stupid suicide pact with Nancy. No, no, none of that. Well, all I can say is that we really tried. Everybody tried to talk to him, Steve and Paul. And Malcolm even went to the extent of physically kidnapping um, Nancy at one time, knowing that um, she was a, an extremely bad influence on him in, in that direction. And um, certainly really tried everything he could do to talk to him. And you would get through to him. And then the next day, you'd be back to square one again. It's a huge leap from the person who was uh, watching the band to the, to the person who's, who's basically dying on stage with them like two years later. But that's what, you know, that's what the Pistols were about. They were supposed to do that. They were supposed to, you know, go as high as they could, explode and, and leave a lot of debris. And uh, they did that. And 
one of them had to be a casualty to make the myth work, you know, and Sid was only too willing to do it, it seems. Sid is to punk and to rebellion what Elvis is to rock and roll. I mean, you know, it's just full stop, end of chapter, end of book. I think a moment where an entire generation essentially kind of rebels completely and utterly against the system in pretty much every definition of what the system is, is always going to be really interesting, always really fascinating, always really relevant, particularly when you look at society now, and it is pretty conformist when Pete Doherty is about as scary as it gets. <laughs> I hope he leaves a fucking brilliant legacy. Sid was a style icon. You know, if you if you log on to things these days, kids are more likely to log on to Sid than they are to Johnny. And he had plenty to say, and he had a chance, and he didn't. The way he died has shrouded so much about him. It's actually quite hard to find um, the real Sid. I was surprised that anybody was ever ever still interested in the, in the Sex Pistols, and so now, it, yeah, it, they, don't, they won't go away. He's kind of like preserved an aspect, you know, James Dean, Hendrix, Sid. He's always gonna look that young, but I bet he don't look that great right now, somewhere in a box, or, I don't know, wherever he's supposed to be. I think he left this legacy of punk, and I think he's left the big list behind. He sort of kept the, the thing going, really, because the, because the whole punk thing is really is the Sid and Nancy story, isn't it? And he was the epitome of what punk rock really was about. You can make a cartoon of Sid, you know, the spiky hair, the, you know, he'll have his swastika shirt or whatever and his jacket and everything, his 50s jacket. And, and when you've got, it's, a, it's, it's kind of, an, I guess, an iconic uh, image that people can understand, latch on to immediately. He had the sense to have kind of managed to have done something or been something out of life, yes, for sure. This is this is the tragedy, of course, with drugs and drink and all that. But you know, I suppose what's meant to be is meant to be. Lots of deluded and ignorant youngsters looking up to someone you could just, you actually should be feeling complete pity for, and that, that's bizarre. You know, you don't want your heroes as someone you, 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 who can do things that you can't. Not that, not you can't do anything. You know, can't, they can't even. They can't even lie in bed without sitting fighting themselves. It is the sort of the ultimate punk star, the kind of the punk rocker who killed his girlfriend, couldn't do anything and was completely stupid. I mean, you can't get any more punk than that. He looked good, he lived a fast life, he died young, he, you know, there was death, there was lots of drama in it. You know, he looked like a cartoon. What, what else do you want to make a, you know, an anti-hero? He had it all, really. I think Sid's image has stood the test of time. We all thought Johnny would be the figurehead for the punk movement. It soon became clear that the image people were sort of like reacting to the most was Sid's. I don't know, it just, it, it just looks right. And the fact that he's become the icon for that particular era, and the fact he's one of the few who've actually got their own little, you know, dolls and merchandising aspects to it, I think really is, has proved that. Sid actually wanted to live, and he would like to be remembered as a great musician as a great performer, as a great songwriter, not as this deathly figure, this um, image of disappointment and murder. I think he'd be like, you know, like the new David Essex or something. I think he'd be, you know, like in Stardust. <laughs> it just popped in my head. I think that, that would be Sid, you know, sort of dressed in a white suit in a castle somewhere. You know, he's, he's done his, his, uh, his concept album and he's a, a recluse. <laughs> you know, that boy could have ended up anywhere. If someone had to be the cartoon rock, punk rock, it might as well be said he was pretty good at it. <laughs> well, 
Just looking ahead to tomorrow night, and our songbook comes from Ray Davis. He's so prolific that we've had to split it into two parts, so the second half is Friday at 8. Coming next tonight, well, from the Sex Pistols to Nirvana. Cobain will be proud. Their classic album, Nevermind, is next. Do you know what this was originally composed for? And why the police were called the first night this was performed? And why does this piece end the way it does? Classic greats and the stories behind the music. Join me, Richard E. Grant, for my essential classics every weeknight at 7.30 on Sky Arts 2 HD. Inspired by the science of genes, L'Oreal unlocks Youth Code. Patented Progen technology with an anti-wrinkle formula to reawaken skin's youthfulness. Sunday Time Style calls it a five-star product. New Youth Code from L'Oreal Paris. Have you unlocked yours? Save on a litre bottle of Pims at Morrison's. Now, only half price. Get together with great savings at Morrison's. No way, man, Tim. How long is it going to take? I don't know. Maybe it's my computer. I've got a dodgy router. No, that's not it. It's your software's pants. No, you're both talking rubbish. It's the site. Could be the site. Not your windows open. Or more likely, it's your broadband, you know, 7 p.m. peak time. Should watch it, man. You don't need to make excuses for your broadband. BT is rolling out up to 20 meg speeds, so upgrade to get consistently faster broadband throughout the day. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh. uh, no way. No, I'm a stagnant. Jen will kill me. <laughs> turn it off. Aww. Nah, turn it on. Yeah. Yeah. Switch to BT Total Broadband. Uncle Ben's risotto. Just three minutes. We got a hold a meeting tonight. New Uncle Ben's risotto. Perfect risotto in three minutes from the microwave. Say thank you, we're giving everyone on Vodafone the chance to be at some of Britain's best events. Join in at vodafone.co.uk slash VIP. Power to you. At Currys Now, trade in any old TV and save up to £100 on a huge range of top TVs. Like this LG 42-inch plasma, HD ready, 600Hz, trade in price only 379 this Sony camera is half price, only £89 for 12 million pixels and four times optical zoom. And this Norton Internet Security Performance Pack with virus and ID theft protection, sale price just £27.49, better than half price. The Curry's sale, we can help. Imagine the ultimate music festival. No mud, no camping. No port to lose and a dream lineup. The Who, Queen, Johnny Cash, New Order, The Rolling Stones, Blur, Radiohead, and many more. An entire weekend of awe inspiring performances. Sofa Fest starts Friday on Sky Arts 1 HD. When this album came out, a mere 46,000 copies were shipped out to US record stores. By the end of last year, it had sold nearly 9 million in the States alone. Who else but Nirvana? 
never mind. 